Welcome back to another episode of Growth Vertical. It's a special episode today because I have a special guest, Trevor Blake. Now, for those of you who don't know Trevor, he is the author of New York bestseller, The Three Simple Steps, or Three Simple Steps, should I say. He's a serial entrepreneur who has grown businesses and sold them for around, I think, $300 million, right? And he's released another book as well called The Secrets to a Successful Startup, a recession-proof guide to starting, surviving, and thriving in your own venture. And today we're going to be talking a bit about the secrets to creating success, successful startups and growing fast whilst loving it. And these key things, key themes can also be helpful in being like to be able to be implemented in your personal life for personal growth and also to develop your career. So quickly, if you are liking the content here on Growth Vertical, please be sure to like subscribe and share so we can get the message out there but otherwise let's get into it so thanks for joining joining us trevor it's great to have you on the episode and for a great topic as well before we can get on to how to take control uh, of our situations and like sort of build a business in this day and age let's hear a bit about yourself it'll be good to just understand you know what's your, a bit about your background for example and some accomplishments and the journey so far thank you neil it's a pleasure to be here so um I always enjoy these chats. It's like sitting around the fireside and just, just trying to share best ideas, really. I think that's the most helpful thing. So um, when people look at me, they see a serial entrepreneur because uh, I've, I've built and sold three companies, but I'm currently running four co more companies at the moment. I'm negotiating the sale of my fourth company, which will be my biggest so far. Um, but that's not how I see myself. I, I, I see myself completely different. I, I build businesses simply because I really enjoy the process. It's a magical process of coming up with a winning idea and converting it into the material equivalent that in, makes an impact on people's lives. It's, I just enjoy doing it. Uh, I see myself more as a um, more metaphysical than that, actually, more of a more of a reader and a, and a, and a, and a hiker and a, a nature lover, animal lover, that sort of thing. So that's really who I, I am. I, I grew up in um, North Wales. I, well, I started in Liverpool, was born in Liverpool. Um, we got evicted three times before I was seven years old, and we ended up in North Wales and pretty poor lifestyle in a way, although I didn't recognize that at the time. I thought it was like, you know, Chronicles of Narnia. Um, my dad was unemployed and unemployable my whole life. My my mother was dying of cancer, and we lived on welfare, basically. And and the pattern of my life was pretty much set for me. I was going to be like my dad, who was like his dad, who was like the dad before him, you know, um, pretty much mostly unemployed yeah. uh, or, in, or in the forces. And uh, I wanted something different. And, and fortunately for me, being in North Wales in the 70s, um, the English were, were pretty much hated at that time. They were buying up, you know, farms and, 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 holiday, and homes and turning them into holiday homes. And there was a big movement to try and get the English out and they were burning holiday homes. But so because of my accent and because of who I was, my, my character, etc., I was pretty much a target for bullying. So, you know, for a while I would fight, uh, but I was only five foot eight, so not much chance of winning any of those fights. And, and so I, uh, I ended up just getting out of everybody's way. And I used to hide out in the town library until everybody got bored and went home and or the bullies got bored and went home. And, and I just started reading and I started reading biographies and, and also books about quantum physics. And I just came I just became inspired by reading about all these amazing people through time in all kinds of different aspects of life, you know, adventurers and musicians mm -hmm. and business people. And, and they had started off in even worse circumstances but they hadn't let it beat them down. They'd used it. They'd used the the, the um, difficult conditions to to form their character and to, and to find a way out. And, and that's where I started to notice patterns of behaviour. And I introduced them in my life at that very young age, and that's become my life. I had an adventure of travel, and then when I was forty years old, I decided to start my my first company. Right. And I've, I've, I, all all of that has been using the same three steps that are in the book. Three simple steps. I mean, it's a, the book's kind of it's it's, it's semi -bi biographical for me. Uh, there's a lot about. I've been so blessed to be surrounded by incredibly powerful women. So my mum was a huge inspiration to me. She introduced me to my wife when I was 20, and she was a massive inspiration to me for the next 40 years. Unfortunately, she died a year ago, but um, so I'm having to learn to live on my own now. <laughs> Sorry to hear about that. <laughs> having to fend for myself. Sounds like you've been through some no, really no, I'm, tough I'm situations. I, 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 no, no, no. I mean, everyone says that, and I appreciate that. But actually, you know, to have forty happy years is a rare thing these days. And so, I am actually my, my overriding emotion is gratitude because she taught me so much. My wife was very intuitive, and I, I love, love being around intuitive people because it helps me so much in life. But also, as we'll probably talk about in this in this podcast, you know, how important the, having the confidence to make intuitive decisions as an entrepreneur is. Yeah, um, I've learned that from my mother, and my wife. So. I was going to say that the fact that you, I guess it's almost like a blessing in disguise when you say that you're waiting around right in the in the library and then having to like read books but what those books led to is yeah. a completely different 
like there's, there's just different, different scale to actually having gone through that experience. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can actually say book saved my life. I can actually say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rather than uh, what the lot of the world is actually like fighting about how books have been burnt, but it's really bad. Um, but yeah, I guess what what made you write like the three simple steps and like the, and then the, the carry on from that sort of secrets to a successful startup? What was the motivation behind those two? I'm not a fan of self help per se. I'm not, you know. So many books are written by authors who achieved nothing before their book caught on for some reason. They, they found a contract and got on the Oprah Winfrey show and, it, you know, the book becomes a bestseller. Right. And I've read them all and I like reading them and they make you feel better about the life you have, but they don't give you a better life. They're very, very few of them have tools and techniques that you can implement straight away. A lot of them just make you, they sound good, they're like new agey uh, verses and, you know, I think, oh, well, wouldn't that be lovely if I just had to sit here and let everything arrive mm -hmm. and life isn't like that, of course. So I, I decided I wanted to write a, an authentic self-help book, but I, I didn't dare write it until I'd, I felt like I at least got, I could at least stand up and say, look, I, I am as flawed and screwed up as anybody. I need these steps and I use them all the time. Look what it did. Right. And so I waited until I sold my first company. So my first company, I started with $200 uh, dollars, and I sold it for 105.5 million six years later. And it was a unique company, unique business model, starting up in a completely different way. Everybody said I was crazy and it wouldn't work. It turned out to be highly profitable, obviously. And so at that point, I thought, you know, okay, I'm going to share what I learned in the library with these three simple steps. And I think th that gave it a bit, and also I, I don't do it for me. So, so all my proceeds go to cancer research and development. So that kind of added the authentic authenticity that I felt was missing from a lot of the self-help personal development. So that's how that came about. The, the, the truth behind it all is that I told my wife I was going to take a sabbatical. And after two weeks, she said, if you don't start something new, I'm going to merge it. <laughs> so, so, that was, so basically, I, was, I, was, I did it because it was the right time to do it, but also because I was under threat of, uh, of getting, being extinguished by my wife. <laughs> uh, there's always that external pressure, right? I think they say um, there's a lot of it going around, actually. Like when you put yourself under pressure, whether it's time, a time-based deadline or there's just an external pressure or in, or just within the household, it's totally different. I mean, I guess naturally I'm Indian myself. So we get a lot of like pressure from the, t from the higher ups and we're saying, Hey, well, you know, you, you've got to make sure you're, d you're on the move the entire time. There's no such thing as just sitting back and resting. Right. So it's just, uh, I, I, I get that to some degree. Right. Uh, w one interesting thing is that you talk about something like I, I was reading some, a bit about the background, right. And what you've done in the past. And I believe you were actually in house yourself, right? Like you were working for a couple of big businesses as well. Um, and then like after that, so you didn't, you didn't actually start off right in like the twenties or anything like that, which a lot of the generation we're seeing what people wanting to create businesses at early age now, but you started off late, right? Could you talk a bit about how, what was the mindset shift between going from back then to now and how that could also add to the idea of wanting someone wanting to create a successful startup? You know, it's surprising. Most people are surprised to learn that the average age of a first time startup entrepreneur is 45. That's quite, a, most people think it's a lot younger. Yeah. The first time, so, and the age of a first time billionaire, self made billionaire is 63. Mm -hmm. so, so the ages are still quite up there. Um, for, for me, and money was never something that I thought about or wanted. I think when you start a business, a lot of people start it because they start to think about money. And so the same thing happened for me. I, I went with growing up poor, my wife grew up poor too. She, she's from Sunderland originally and so um you know we didn't get to travel as kids we didn't get to get in i didn't know what an airplane was or a ship you know so so i just we just wanted to travel so we had a a, a wonderful i had a fast track career and and um uh, worked for some fantastic companies. I was very lucky. I had some great bosses who taught me a lot mentored me so that really helped and I got to understand how businesses interact together not you know i'm a sales and marketing guy mm -hmm. in my regular career but I, I i was fascinated by manufacturing distribution regulatory all the rest of it i wanted to know how the business worked and that, i think that was smart if, if if you if some of your listeners or viewers are still in a regular job i used to think of it as paid training so i so i do my job but i also want to know about all the other aspects of the business because i knew one day i would start my own company but for me it was just turning 40. I, I went to bed feeling immortal on the last night of my 39th year and then when i woke up the next morning i looked six months pregnant and it's just something something you know changed in my head yeah. and i thought well it's time it's time to be serious about money and, and i'd uh, you know i think uh, for myself it's this is true but for most successful entrepreneurs i meet it's also true there's no one really sets out to be a successful entrepreneur i think we all have it in our heads that one day we'd like to be our own boss 
But then we find something that, we, that irritates us, like something we want to fix or something. We're looking for a solution, but no one's come up with it yet. And in the end, you say, you know what? I'll fix it myself. Like, like a Richard Branson, you know, getting into the airline business. Mm. That was never intentional. You know, that was because he, was, he, he had a date in a Caribbean island and his flight was cancelled and he was afraid he was going to be jilted by his girlfriend. So he chartered a plane and started an airline just like yeah. that. You know, we fix things. I think entrepreneurs are real, really good fixers. So in the job I had, there was a, a, something that was, had irritated me so much that I'd had stand-up rows with the CEO several times, which is not smart. And uh, in the end, I just thought, you know, I, I'll, t I'll tell him, I'll go to him and I'll say to him, I want to buy the rights to that product and I'll do it my own way. And fortunately, they needed the money at the time. And so it all kind of came together all at the same time. And I was, I was walking through an airport and the idea for the business model just hit me as I was just walking, I was going to the, the, um, the lounge. Uh, in those days, it was Northwest Airlines, Northwest Airlines lounge in, in Minneapolis. Yeah. And it just hit me like a blueprint. I thought, I'll do it that way. And uh, that's how it started. That's pretty interesting, actually, because you talk about something like um, blitz scale wizardry, right? And uh, it's like how to only work about five hours a day, but also well, well, with no employees, by the way, and to also like live your live your life, essentially love it, right? Could you tell me about what right. you mean about yeah, what do you mean about blitz scale wizardry? Like, why do you frame it that way? Uh, because it's all about peak brain performance. The, the, you know, when, all the studies that sort of measure how people work in the corporate world show that, you know, you can, be in the, you can be in the office 10 hours, but you're only productive for just over two hours of that time. The rest of the time, you're searching on the internet, talking around the coffee uh, machine, stuff like that. So you're not really productive. And so when you become an entrepreneur, and, and especially if you're on your own, I'm, I've always been a one-man band because I like it that way. And um, it's easy to get burned out because, because, you know, you sit in front of your computer waiting for an email or waiting for the phone to ring. Definitely not. And if it doesn't, yeah. And if it, and if it doesn't happen, you think I must be doing something wrong. You know, I'm obviously not cut out to be an entrepreneur. So all those, for all of those things, I started to study before I even started peak brain performance. And it was showing that we can't concentrate very well for more than two hours. And after that, we kid ourselves, we're getting into the zone, but we get diminishing returns on our effort. But the other side of my life is, is you know, um, my education is in is in physics and so the other side of my life is a fascination with energy and so i you know i know contrary to what most people believe that the brain is at its most creative when it's tired mm -hmm. so so i split my day up into so i don't work before nine o'clock don't touch any electronics don't i start my day in this particular way that's what i learned from biographies when i was younger that they spent more time sits you know walking in the woods than they did you know walking around an office because uh -huh. that's where the magic happens so 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 i'll start at nine and i'll work till 11 and then I treat the break as with the same discipline and determination as I've just treated the two hours of work. And the, my little, you probably just heard it, my little watch goes and I say, okay, now I've got to go and do this. And so I'll go and take a walk and I'll walk for an hour with the dogs or I have an animal sanctuary now. So sometimes I just walk around the animal sanctuary and I connect, you know, with the animals and, and do some physical work and all that sort of thing. And that's where the magic happens. And I think, oh, why didn't I think of that before? It comes to me, you know, instead of me trying to figure this thing out, sitting in front of my computer for 10 hours. Um, and so I, that I build that into my life. So the, the, the practical magic of the five hour workday uh, talks about how that you, life used to be like that before the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's only the advent of, you know, the, the spinning jenny and factories developing and having to keep the, because there's no artificial light source, right. having to keep the factories open all day. Like, that's, what made us, that's what made us these slaves to the machine that we are, we still are today, doing eight, nine, 10 hour days. You, laborers only used to work four hours a day before 1740. And so I've, I've always believed you can get back to that because I've, no, I've noticed in my own life, when I take those breaks, when I nap in the afternoon, and that sounds, most people say, what, you nap in an afternoon? But NASA requires all its pilots to take an afternoon nap because it improves their performance 34%. So I, I, kind of a, I have a scientific, maybe a nerdy or a geeky side to me, when I read stuff like that, I'm, I'm you know, I, I have no natural skills. So I'll say, well, I'll try that. And, and, and it works. And so I build that into my, so the, on my website, trevorgblake.com, there's a download that it's free. It's no, there's no, it's, it was my contribution during COVID, if you like, because so many people were moving into working from home and without any training or any education of how to do right. that. So the practical magic of the five hour work day is a free short course that you can download. And I call it practical magic because you know, that's exactly what it is. Magic is just converting one form of energy into another. And it's very practical. It shows you how to split up your day and the reasons for doing that. And the feedback I get from people who, who start to introduce that into life is phenomenal because rather than feeling that they're cheating in some way, they come back to me and say, I've never been so productive in all my life. And I'm having all these amazing ideas. And, and even in the corporate world, they're starting to be viewed as something of a troubleshooter. 
because they're coming up with solutions all the time. That's the that's, that's what that's all about. But the you know the the true benefit to that is that you have a balanced life. Yeah. You know, I I, I didn't want work to interfere with with my home life ever. It is, and uh, I, I think it's pretty cool that you said that because I've also tried to implement work slots like deep work slots into my routine. So. I'll optimize my essentially life, right? So that I can get up at a certain time where I know as soon as I hit the table, as soon as I get on the screen on my laptop, I already know what I'm going to be working on. I know what I'm going to be doing. And I've realized that there are, it's okay to have disruptions sort of once in a while, right? Because you know that it's, it's about getting into the rhythm sort of thing, right? And actually implementing the idea. But I realized the, mo the longer I sat there and sort of in excruciating pain to try and like solve something and I'm like, oh, I've spent four or five hours on this. I still can't get it when you can and you come back and let's say the next day you did the same task, but you do it within like an hour and a half. The, the difference is immense, right? You can get so much more done and it's okay. I think where I think we're getting stuck in this loop or this sort of, uh, how do you say it, routine that we have to spend eight hours and eight hours only on that one thing to, to showcase that we've done work, but it's time based yeah, and, and not deliverable. And we're indoctrinated that way, yeah. you know, especially if you come from the corporate world or sc you know, school indoctrinates yeah. that way, you know, that you're sat doing your lessons and you've got to stay in the class. And, you know, e even if you, even if you pick up the knowledge in five seconds, you've got to stay there for another, you know, 59 minutes and 55 yeah, seconds, absolutely. you know, until everybody else gets it. And we're so kind of indoctrinated <laughs> into that. And, one of the wonderful things about being an entrepreneur is that you can just throw all that out the window and you, you, you set your own schedule and, and choose your own life. Now, I do know entrepreneurs who work 10 hour, 12 hour days and they seem to, I don't know what they do during that time because I, 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 I feel guilty because I actually don't work more than two or three hours at the moment, even with four companies. Um, but they're on the, those entrepreneurs are on their third marriage and, and the kids can't stand them and the dogs don't know who they are. I mean, what's, what kind of life is that? So, so I, I think if you, if you, if you, Give balance a try. You'll surprise yourself how, how much more productive you become and how much more successful. But you'll be so much happier. The stress goes away. Um, you know, your, your, your family is not hating you because you're always on the phone and always working yeah. and stuff like that. And I think it's important to, to make it a point that for everyone out there, sort of, you should be trying, right? Just try something new. If you've got an idea and you know that it might, you've noticed that you're more productive in the evenings, but for what reason? Do you ever think about that? Like, you know, why are you productive not in that first... 9 9 a.m. hour why are you productive more at 10 30 maybe after you've let breakfast settle or like had had read a couple of articles maybe it, maybe your morning is the learning slot and then you work it work towards the uh, later part of the morning and that's when you start kicking off on work but i guess that brings me to like this interesting point about and you probably know no stranger to seeing this as well trevor but do you feel like there's a sudden solo movement in the in the last five to eight years specifically right and like why do you think that is i mean we can easily say it's something like the internet right but why else do you think that is right and should we be all doing it i think the tools are there now to help us do that that's certainly that's certainly true i mean when i started my first company it was still dial-up internet and and it was it was you know i remember it took me half a day getting knocked locked out all the time on the dial-up just to just to uh, incorporate my company mm -hmm. just to make it an LLC. So, so it's certainly got a lot easier, but it, um, it's actually something different. And, and, you know, here we can go off into, into something that for other people might sound new age or we were actually scientific. Um, so there's a shift in energy right now. And, you know, it goes by different names. A lot of sages call it the, you know, golden age of transformation. And it's basically a shift from, it's a planetary energy mm -hmm. shift. And, and it's, you know, we, th we tend to think of, of, of energy as being up and down. So we give it judgment up is good down is bad but it's, it's a wave right so energy moves in a wave and it's all one so there's no good or right. bad but we're shifting we're shifting from this thing that we call masculine energy this isn't a gender conversation but it, but it, this is how people describe it and that's a flat slow methodical have a problem call a meeting type of energy yeah and that's gone and you can see the companies that are structured that way the big hierarchical co companies like you know circuit city and border books and 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 um uh uh, Blockbuster, you know, they were household names and the average age of a company back then when these were at the top, at the peak, you know, it's about 75 years. Now it's down to 20 years and it's, it's going down even faster. And one of the reasons is the energy has shifted from that methodical sort of male mentality of the clipboard to this fast spiraling energy. We can all feel it. It's, it's the energy of rapid technological change. It's the energy of being able to adapt. And that's why, um, learning to connect to your intuition is so important now because you don't have time to call meetings anymore mm -hmm. you know if you find a problem 
in the old days, it would be write a report and the report would take weeks to go up the ladder to the top. Absolutely. And some, a filtered version would come back down. But today that's too late. You're out of business. It's like the daily headache. And, and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, performance and appraisal reviews and all of that, the, this sort of internal whirlpool, as I call it. The days of that have gone. So, so, so the reason I think why this solo world is now possible and it's never been more possible is that we feel this swirling energy and we change quickly and we have to adapt to it. And you don't, so, so you're better on your own because then you, you don't have to ask anybody or tell anybody, you know, or supervise anyone. So, so that's why I really like being a, um, you know, one man band, yeah. but that means that, that means that in the startup, you have to structure differently. Mm -hmm. So where, whereby in the old energy, you would, you would kind of leave the corporate world and you'd say, okay, well, so I know sales and marketing cause that's what I've done for, you know, 10 years, whatever. Mm -hmm but I don't understand finance and I don't understand. So you'll, you'll hire ahead of this and ahead of that and ahead of the other. That's not the right way to start. I don't believe in that. I think in this, in this, um, uh, new era, this, this golden age of transformation, I think it's very easy to do what I call a model of alliances or a hub model whereby you use vendors and contractors and, and your supervisory skills, which were top down before mm -hmm. are now lateral. So, so now it's peer to peer and it's trust and it's so much more rewarding to work like that. There's, you know, you know, to be able to work with people who you really like and get on with and who you trust, you don't have to supervise them. You, you know, if they call, it'll be, you know, just more, more likely to be talking about family or the stock market than it is to be talking about issues because they know what they're doing. <laughs> and, and so, so that, and that adds to the ability to, to not have to work all the hours, you know, to be able to just work a couple of hours a day. I think an important question was like, that comes to me is like, should we be all, do, should all of us be doing this, right? Should we be going the, our own way? Should we be going solo? And I, I guess it's, I would say that whenever someone asks me this, like, I want to go and start something, I always ask them, why do you even want to start it? What's wrong with what you're doing? Right. Maybe you can change right. the current environment that you're working in. Right. And you may be happier. So, but I guess it's just about the aim, right? I guess you said that everyone does sort of want to become their own boss by the end at some point, but do you think it's okay? Like, do you think it's okay? Some people actually have the feeling that I don't want to become a boss. I just like the idea of yeah. doing my set time. Yeah, I, met, I, I was blown away a few years ago. I, I, one of my companies was audited by the uh, Internal Revenue Service here in, in America. And, um, and I got on, I, I had everything, it was fine and there was no adjustments, but I knew it was going to be fine. But, she, but this person who'd come, the, the agency yeah. or the agent that came to my house was due to spend three days doing it. And I said, you'll be done in an hour. <laughs> what are you going to do for three days? And she said, well, I have to make it last years. And she was explaining to me that, because she saw me now, okay, you're an entrepreneur, you've got these companies, I get, I get how everything's structured. But she was, she was saying, you know, I, I don't want to do that. I don't, I'm quite happy going to work at nine and coming home at five and doing a job that's slow and the rest of it. And that's fine. If that's who you are, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. If that's who you are, you probably won't be listening to this, this show. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, but there's a percentage of people who just, I, I don't know, I just get, uh, we, we get sort of burned out with the corporate nonsense meeting, you know, meeting after meeting I agree. and an ego people trying to impress each other and people putting other people down for the, for their benefit to be away from all of that, to never have to call a meeting unless you want to is so freeing. It's, it's, it, I wake up in the morning excited every single day. And I have since the first day I started my, well, I have most of my life because of, because of the three simple steps, but particularly since I became um, an entrepreneur, uh, you wake up just full of excitement. And, and you're in control and, and what's better than being in control of your life experiences. Yeah, I agree. Cause like there's, I hear so much like on a Sunday night when everyone says on Monday, oh, it's, it's, it's Monday now and it, oh God, Monday's here. And I'm there thinking in my head, guys, I don't, I don't feel the same way. I don't, I'm actually, I don't, I actually don't mind. I just like going in on my Monday and trying to figure out something else that's new or trying to help out whatever business I'm helping out at the moment to grow right on the marketing front. And I think it's okay, right? It's just about the mindset shift. And when I was reading even a bit about what you've said, like the whole spiritual and like sort of just simple things like doing meditation, right? To calm your mind. And, and so you have, make sure you have focus, right? I think it sort of Im improves positivity, like or it sort of includes positivity, positivity into your life. And I think when you start to build that relationship that what am I doing? Like, is it just because I'm treating it like work right what if work was just fun it's just creating your version of art of what you're good at etc it's just about i guess that mindset uh the mindset shift right um it's pretty interesting it's pretty interesting but sorry you're gonna say something 
No, no, I was, I was agreeing with you because I, I, you know, I hinted before that there's a there's a period in the morning where I have a, a particular routine. So the very first thing I do every single day is meditate. That's that's the, the first thing and the number one. Thing. Yeah, and and I got that from all the biographies. I found that all of these amazing people through history had their own version of. They called it different things at different times, but they had their own version of getting quiet yeah. before they start. Yeah, and that's been one of the best tools in my in my arsenal my whole life. Yeah, I guess everyone has their own medium, right, to make sure that they're more productive, but. Let's let's move on to the startup side of things, right? So, uh, I guess this is where things get pretty interesting. So, like, we talk about like the foundations of practical magic, right? So, how to think big, you mentioned, and make that real magic, right? How should people really be thinking in this day and age, considering there's so many devices? So, we've got the tools, but we're constantly distracted at the same time. So, how should you, you know, how should people really? be thinking these days and so to better themselves and to keep themselves keep things future proof i should say so there's a there's a there's a program or a process uh, that go through it three simple steps outlines it i have a course at trevorgblake.com called transformation which takes 30 days it's life changing it's it, it, you know it doesn't work just for some people it works for everybody but you have to want change it's the number one thing you've got to be prepared for change because because mm -hmm. when you get on the path of you know controlling your own life experiences everything changes and and opportunities show up that you never would have imagined which means that you know the people around you right now will probably change to an extent where you're living will change it, the opportunity to relocate you'll you'll be surrounded by a completely different group of, of peers very quickly so so once you're ready for change and then you commit to change then there's certain things that you go through and one of the things that's so important is this sense of discipline that you have to take you know you, you can't do this you know uh, there's, there's a f American phrases I could use, but you can't do this at half speed. You, you know, this is you're either all in or not. And um, I think that's a wonderful process. That's the, that is the magical. You know, the definition of magic is just the, uh, the conversion of one form of energy into another form of energy mm -hmm. within the laws of nature under the power of will. That's all it is. And that's what we do. If an artist has a blank canvas and they, they fill the blank canvas, that's, just, that's the same process. That's magic. And we do it with businesses. You know, we have an idea and then we react forward to it and we we at that point, we're committed to it. So, so it's very important once you come up with a winning idea that you react immediately, mm -hmm. that, that, that you don't just sit on this idea because a year from now, someone else will come up with the same idea and will beat you to it. And there's nothing worse than that. I've seen that happen many times through procrastination. So, so in my book, Seekers to a Successful Startup, it's, a, it's, like, it's like stepping stones across a pond. There's certain steps you go through, but the, the reason you go through these steps, winning idea to the, to the reacting forward through corporation, to then doing a business plan that isn't a piece of paper. It's getting away from your desk and going talking to potential customers. Mm -hmm. That's a business plan. All of that process allows you to, to sort of start in a, in a way that gives you the best opportunity to succeed rather than the old-fashioned way of starting which was you know oh, i'll get some office space i'll hire a personal assistant and you know i'll i'll spend a year writing a business plan and try business and get costs. investors <laughs> yeah that, do we need them gone then no and people are you know these days a book is a business card you know you really need you really need you know a product um so, so you go through that and then a proof of concept because we, we, you know, in these times, everybody expects to be able to try something before buying. That's the, that's the world, right? If, if I was, it, you know, I, I, can, I can buy 12 of these shirts and then decide I don't like them, I don't like the color and send them back. And someone's had to pay for that inventory, get it made, you know, get it shipped, then, then put it back into the system. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly different world than the one I started even 20 years ago, getting into business. And you, so I've adapted to that. I've changed my mentality. I've changed my systems and all this bit so that I start in a way that's appropriate for the modern market. And the, the modern market, I think, gives us a, a, I don't think, I think history will show there's never been a better time to do this because the tools are there to help you do it. And we live in a world of, get big fast man mm. we can okay the old world of starting local if you're good go regional if you're really great go national you know and then if you're you know the, the you know super uh, good to great company which obviously most of them don't exist anymore um you'd go international yeah it, it's not like that i can come up with an idea and i can go international in five seconds and and so you'll see we're seeing this all the time so my my the best example for me has been um you know, a company called mirror.com. I don't know if you know that it's uh, the big mirror where you work out in front of it and it gives you loads of statistics. You know, the, the entrepreneur, the, the founder of that, she came up with the idea around Christmas two years ago. And, you know, it started, it was really expensive piece of equipment, $1,500. People said it's too expensive. It'll never catch on. And she sold it almost, you know, less than two years later for 500 million. 
to Lululemon. Th those opportunities I, I'm, I'm reading about every week now. The opportunity to, to turn a brilliant, a, a moment of insight into convert that energy into the energy of money and the energy of, of, of success. I've seen that all the time, but it's critical that you start the right way because otherwise uh, most people don't understand cash flow. And you know, 82% of all business failures are down to cash flow mismanagement. And, and if you want to understand that, I've got it in very simple format in Secrets to a Successful Startup. And I'm not plugging a book because I, I don't, my, my $1.50 royalty goes to cancer <laughs> research and development. <laughs> and I don't need the 150. So, um, uh, but it, but it, it's, people like it because it's step by step and it feels safe. So they think, okay, I've started the right way and I haven't used up all my beautiful cash yet. That's good. Yeah, I think, you know, just go back a bit. I, I've been actually bit by my own actions in not bettering myself or just stop learning because I got into the the, the idea of, oh, okay, I've, I've graduated now or I've just got this job now. So now I don't need to learn a bit more or I don't need to aim for the next best thing. And you get, you're getting comfortable, right? And I know you've answered my question about how to not get stuck into that mindset, right? And sort of building momentum. And I think a lot of people said, I don't, a lot of people do say like, I don't have momentum to do this. Or I don't have the motivation to do this, but they don't realize that they need to, they, it's not some motivation. It's not something you just create, right? It's something that you build over time, but you've got to take the first step um, and bettering yourself. But I realized as soon as I started learning, reading books, just simple things like that, these, these small tweaks on reading outside my subject and, and understanding what other people have done. Case studies are really good, really good source of understanding what people have been through and how you can sort of use those ideas to better yourself. I, I would say that things started moving, right? And I started thinking more outside the box. And, you know, I think everyone has been through a, a sort of a negative and gone into a negative spiral where they've like, oh yeah, let's just, it's comfortable or I feel stuck or maybe I feel a bit bored, you know, simple things like that. Or I'm just spending too much time doing this one piece of work and now it's just getting repetitive and boring, tedious. But it was always down to that mindset shift and actually moving outside your comfort zone, which I constantly make a big deal about. Like it's okay the outside of comfort zone. If you're uncomfortable, it means you're gonna you're gonna grow because you're gonna overcome something and then you're going to get better, right? And I constantly make that, especially with growth marketing on the startup front, which is typically startups is who I work with. I always say that the reason why I'm a growth marketer is because testing, experimentation, and looking at the data to understand what's gone well and what's gone wrong is actually what's the most interesting part, right? The fact that we can actually test an idea out that you actually have, then say no, that's better than me just saying no right out the gate, right? Uh, without any proof. And um, it's just about that comfort zone. Comfort zone is always in every environment. It's personal growth, whether it's startup growth, we're always in that situation. And I think there's... It's about like you mentioned thinking fast, right? So actually, I guess that's why even if we look at during COVID, you know, platforms like Slack and, 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 you know, Zoom and people like that started skyrocket, right? They were doing well in business because the tools were there. There's just certain situations that force us to use these tools and people just had to adapt rapidly. And I think it's just decision-making, isn't it? Rapid decision-making to make your company grow fast as well. Yeah. Uh, big and fast in that and, sort of time. And, but, yeah, and and I go back to intuition. It's it's you've got to that, you know a lot of people don't have confidence in their own ability to make smart decisions, but that's not that's natural. That's normal. I was the same. But you can learn. You can there's tools and techniques. I've got you know trevorgblake.com mm. that are, you know you can just go and read them, and uh, and and they give you this. They 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 allow you to start to trust yourself again, so that you you get the confidence that you can look at a complicated set of data and you can immediately hone down to what's important and you make a decision and you move on there's no one to blame and there's no one to pat on the back it's just you these days so typically um it, you know it takes a little for a lot of people it takes a little bit of of playing with energy as i call it in order to learn to trust their intuition again uh, you know if, if if i could bottle women's intuition i would be the richest man in the universe not just on the planet you know but um but i'm i'm not so so i've i've worked for 30 years on building my, a better connection with my intuition and i'm probably you know if my wife was 100% on her intuition i was probably at 5 when i started mm -hmm. and so i'm probably at about 25 now but that's enough you know that's enough to be successful and um, all or you know everyone i talk to who's who's quote unquote successful they say the same thing i i just go with my gut I make gut decisions and um, I used to do it in my regular career and and it was really hard because people would call me stubborn or obdurate because I wouldn't shift from my opinion and um, you know 
then I then I became as I got up the ranks, I became known as something of a troubleshooter because he's always right. He's the guy that finds the you know he doesn't even understand this part of the business, and yet he can tell us what the problem is or how to solve the problem. And it's all because of that connection to intuition. And and so if if people want to start, especially men, uh, women, this is great news for female entrepreneurs who are now more than half of all all startups mm -hmm. in America because they have the advantage finally, you know. And uh, for, for 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 the rest of us, us, us Neanderthals, we're going to have to do some work to catch up. I think that's where we put in the, the graft in the background as well, right? So constantly going through, like you mentioned, just looking at how people dealt, in, dealt with certain problems in certain situations. And there are a lot of startups out there right now, right? And that's, how, that's why I wanted to move on to like sort of the rapid uh, intuitive decision making, right? Because do you think there's a common problem amongst the new startups right at the moment and how they're progressing? Like even though COVID, for example, propelled some of them, Right. I guess it's by chance, maybe some, an element of luck as well. And because of the nature of the product and so long that they market well, obviously they can progress. But do you think that there's a problem, a common problem with current startups that are moving slowly? I think it's the same problem for, for all of them. Um, and so I'm, I'm a, I, 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 like you read a lot of articles. I, I read a couple of hours, three hours a day and, and, um, when I read articles about what makes some companies successful and others not successful, it always comes down to the same two things. Mm -hmm. And, and I've, you know, included references to this in three simple steps, if, if anyone's interested. And so, um, the main thing is self-confidence. And then the second thing is a tendency to set targets. And, and what I find with what I find, so, so this will uh, surprise a few people. When I started my first company, before I had even thought about what the company would be structured or what it would look like, I already imagined myself selling it for at least $100 million. And so that's a technique, I call it intention setting. It's, I, we crush time, so, so we go into a thing called time imagination. And, and, and so all of life is energy and, theref and therefore, if we look in one direction through the universe, it's the future. If we look in one direction through the universe, it's the past, but it still exists. It still goes on. So you can use tricks because it's shown through neuroanatomy that the, you know, the brain can't tell the difference between what's real and what's imagined. And that's a key thing for us. So when I meet new entrepreneurs, I find they don't think big enough mm -hmm. and they haven't set a big enough target and they're not already imagining and feeling what success feels like. They're, they're in a sense that they're, they're, they've started something and then they've put themselves into what I call the quicksand of thinking, how am I going to do this? I never figured, I mean, I've been uniquely unqualified for every, every company I've built. I, it, there's no point in trying to figure it out because as soon as you start, it'll look different to what you imagined. That was the best piece of business advice I was ever given. I was waxing lyrical to the guy who built Amgen and Icos, you know, $140 billion worth of enterprise. And I was cocky enough to wax lyrical about my business plan, you know, this new idea. And he held his hand up, probably out of boredom. And he said, Trevor, you don't know what business you're in until you get in the business, just start. And so I started and I realized he was right that it, it, I thought I was going in one direction. It, it immediately got another opportunity to go in a different direction that was bigger, which I would never have found if I hadn't started. So with, so with most entrepreneurs, I find that they're, they're trying to figure out how to, how to, to be a successful entrepreneur, right. but they're not even thinking big enough. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not even, you know, it, it's all in front of them mentally. Whereas a subtle shift in the way we use our practical magic by imagining the future already successful and feeling what that feels like that's when all the magic shows up and we'll get these breakthrough ideas. We'll be in the shower and we'll go, ah, I'll do it that way. Um, most entrepreneurs burn themselves out trying to figure it. They think it's down to them, but it's not, it's just energy. They're, they're just the conduit of this energy to build something impactful. So it's a different way of thinking. If any, you know, for, for those who are interested, Trevor G is, is I, I call it where science spirit and entrepreneurship come together. Finally. That's pretty interesting. Cause like I've, the number I've mentioned earlier about how burnout was like a thing, right? And I felt like at one point overwhelmed, right? When I thought, when I went from in-house to running things solo and, and now working on project paces, et cetera. And at one point I could, I was actually doing that, right? I was going 10, 12 hours a day. I'd say I was sitting on the screen, right? But the entire day, it's like, how can you sit at the screen? At one point, I loved it, right? But then afterwards, it really catches up with you. So I just realized you got to you got to move away, right? Got to change the setting, go for walks, etc. And and actually, one thing I think a technique was so a five, five you get five days in a week, or you get seven days in a week, of course, but five work uh, working days as people like to treat it so that they can get Saturday and Sunday with family and friends is perfectly fine. But they say that if you can productively work in the first four days. 
and then leave the fifth day, so your Friday, maybe to just typically brainstorming and just maybe going going out out or like reading books or something just to generate new ideas. You'd be surprised on how many problems you solve that you actually have. So for me, for example, how can I cut down the f- simple fact of 10 to 20, 12, 10 to 12 hours of working? Maybe I'll work on like the highest priority items first and not just every little thing, right? Uh, learn, learning to say no and actually de- like delegating the right tasks to the right people because they just need to be done by someone else, not because yeah, you have to, right? Uh, sorry, well, you, you should, right? And I think that was super important. And I think all it took was for me to just change my mindset a bit and actually understand that those those balanced days, those brainstorming days, for example, really do help out. And it all starts with that sort of mentality on what routine can I set? How can I refresh my mind in the mornings? Whether it's journaling, whether it's meditation, whether it's just constant normal breaks away from it, whether it's working out, playing football again, you know, those simple things can help you. Um, but it's some pretty, like, we've covered some pretty interesting stuff. So I was going to ask Trevor, like, if you had to summarize, right, how someone would think about in this day and age, how, if you had to summarize, let's say a few bullet points on how someone can create something from, from like scratch right now, but then actually ensure that they pursue it and not just give up when I guess it gets tough in the first few days. Right. Um, because there is a, there is an upfront load of the amount of work that people don't understand that they need to do before you start. Right. It, it, I mean, it comes back to, to discipline and I, I'm not naturally disciplined. I'm, I'm kind of a lazy guy. I'm, I'm quite happy to sit on the couch and watch my soccer team, you know? So, yeah. so, so, um, uh, and I'm from Liverpool, so I'm a Liverpool. I was going to say, who do you support doesn't... Liverpool? <laughs> <laughs> I was never given a choice, even though I'm wearing a blue shirt right now. Um, I was born red, but, um, the discipline is really important and the certain tricks that you can get in the habit of really quickly that will help you for forever mm-hmm. and, and you'll never break these habits. So uh, what science shows that that when we it, we get so distracted, so we can get so distracted so quickly these days. So so I could be uh, writing an email to one of my vendors and I'll hear a ding and it takes all the power in the world not to go and see what that ding was about. And then and they find the ding is somebody saying, can you meet It's a family member saying, can we meet for lunch? And, and you you write back to it, put it back down again. It, it scientifically show, has shown that it takes 35 minutes to get back on track with the same force that you had before that distraction. Mm. So one of the tricks, and not many people do this, but it's, it's a religion for me. Um, I have separate devices for work and for home and never the two cross ever. And so at five o'clock, right, it's earlier than five o'clock for me, but, but I, I, imagine at five o'clock, you shut the office door wherever your office is. Mm-hmm. And those work devices stay in there and they do not intrude in your, in your family life that night. And then the next day, I don't don't even check an email or anything like that till nine o'clock in the morning, even though I get up about half six, and and um, and then it's my and then my work devices come into play, and I can't be distracted therefore during the day by somebody saying, "Hey, just thinking about you, you know, did you see that TV show last night?" Um, that's really important because that helps you be productive. You mentioned, you know, you like to have a list and you do your priority items first. That's that's the last thing I do every day is write my priority list for the next day, and I like to put it up on a wall not have it on the on a on an iphone because when you open that iphone the temptation to start looking at other things is just too great because mm. we're human right we're going to be dry. that's why they work so well it's like a tractor beam we can't well i'll see what the stock market's like today. exactly you know, you've got to avoid it so the, so the discipline is so so important not just the discipline to have work period and then and then relaxation periods but the discipline to not allow private life and work life to interfere with each other at any time i found that to be probably the biggest gift that I ever gave myself learning to do that. Um, it can be awkward because when I have people I have friends visiting and, and they think I'm antisocial because I will not allow them to come into my office while I'm working in the office. You know, it, uh, you know, I, I don't answer their text saying we're going out to the, to the mall. Can you, what, can you join us at, at 12 or something? You know, so they, they, they take it, uh, friends and family take a little while to get used to this way. You know, I, I, they get it after a while he's working in a particularly disciplined way and well, you know, is he, you know, the millions speak for themselves. So that, so therefore they, they leave me alone a little bit, but it takes yeah. a while for that discipline to, to become a way of life. You've got the data to back it up. So it's one of those things. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I mean, it's been interesting. I've actually downloaded, uh, purchased and downloaded the book, 
uh, the secrets to the successful startup. So I'm looking forward to reading that and I'm going to definitely dive into the three simple steps, but I was really going through some, a lot of your content online. You've got quite a few videos on YouTube as well. And, um, and I just think that this has been pretty insightful in the sense that, you know, how do you say it? a lot of people, when they focus on personal growth is very like high, le- super high level, right? And nobody talks about it in terms of what's worked for them all the time. They just talk about what they've heard or, and that sort of thing. Right. So I, I truly appreciate that, how you've come onto this and actually just actually open that up for everyone. So it starts with discipline, of course, Thank and you. then, you know, the, the idea behind decision-making, etc. So I guess, unless, I don't know if you have anything to add, uh, Trevor, like to this episode so far. Uh, just, just that the, you know, the, our, our biggest tool in our arsenal is our imagination. So we haven't really talked about that a whole lot, but if, if people go to trevorgblake.com, you'll see I spend an awful lot of time talking about, because most people don't know how to use their imagination for their benefit. They use their imagination to harm themselves in a way, because they're thinking about money and debt and what they don't have. Uh, when, when we switch that around and we start to think more about what we are, and, and then we change time. So we talk about what we had and what we did instead of what we want. An awful lot of things change for the better for ourselves. And that's all part of the, the three simple steps. It's part of secrets to a successful startup and part, and, and a big part of it in my course transformation. That, that's life changing for most people because, because almost everybody I meet who doesn't know, who doesn't talk about these things. I can, I can tell they've never, never been around trevorgblake.com before because of the words that they use. It actually is pretty uh, you know, interesting. They'll say things like I wish and I, yeah, I wish and I want and all that kind of stuff that doesn't work for yeah. you. So, so changing that, it's, it's subtle and it, you know, it just, it, it takes a little while to get it as a habit. Um, but I noticed you and I are very careful how we use our words. So, it, which is it, it, interesting. We've just learned to be that way. Uh, I think it just took practice, right? Initially, I would say things like I wish and, and that sort of stuff. But then you realize that you got to have that sort of, you got to stay away from the scarcity mindset and almost treat it from abundance, right? So it's almost like... <clears throat> is not that you can't, excuse me, <clears throat> afford something. It's more about, oh, what do I need to do to go and get that, right? Rather than, oh, I simply can't afford it, like right now. Or just simple things like, um, yeah, you, sorry. I mean, you, I, I mean, you know, things like that, mm. when, I, when I, I'm around somebody and they say, oh, I wish I could afford that or I can't afford that, you just switch it around and you say, that'll look great. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, you just, just you just assume you own it and they have it and, and by changing it, cause the brain can't tell the difference. So the brain will give you what you need in order to make that thing happen. I, and I do it with companies, you can do it with everything, but I, I do it with companies too. You know, I mean, I, mean, I the, the first affirmation I ever spoke was, you know, I sold Qual Medical for at least a hundred million dollars and that was before I even started it. And I'm already thinking of after that. And it's, it, it takes a while to get used to. It sounds very new agey, but it's actually scientific. And so if you, if that's of interest to your, your viewers and listeners and uh, trevorgblake.com, it, it's, that's the magic. Yeah. I think in, in the audience as well, that we've had <clears throat> quite a few engineers because I used to be an engine, uh, software engineer and in, 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 as my part of my background. So worked in it quite a bit and, um, did some like basic development, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some engineers and some technical folk in the background who want to like sort of sort of get to grips with personal growth, but then also like go around the marketing route. But I think it's good that we, that you've sort of slotted in imagination there because I guess words of affirmation, things like that, they're really important in this current climate, considering there's so much negativity, right? But the fact that we could use like our mobile phones and, and, and be in touch with negativity or just something, it's almost like we're not asking for negativity. It just gets put in front of us at every moment. So the fact that you are distracted or anything like that steers you away from actually thinking what you should be thinking, like what you want to be thinking because you need to attain that goal. Right. And one thing I quite like what, what he said was the chip, having that sort of chip on your shoulder about, it's not about just the money that you're, that's not the outlook. Yeah. Those are, that's a bonus, right? If you were to do something well, like help certain people and, and actually have fun, right. Love what you're doing the money's going to come naturally to you to a degree, to some degree. I, I truly believe anyway. Absolutely. No, you're right. That's the, that's the mantra in all my companies. I don't do mission, vision, values, but that's been the mantra. And, and I, I, I say it all the time. I say it at trevorgblake.com too. And that's, you know, make a difference in someone's life, have fun doing it. Cause otherwise what's the point? Mm-hmm. And then, sh- then share in all the rewards, material and otherwise that come naturally as a result of setting that energy in, in motion. 
that's that's the mantra for all my companies, and uh, I live by that. And everyone who's around the company and working with it lives by the same thing. And it's, it's a great. It's you know, the success comes to you when when you have your attitude, your energy, and your imagination mm -hmm. aligned correctly. I agree. It's always like the the sort of energy you put out there comes back at you in the comes back to you in the same way, right? Well, you know, I appreciate that, Trevor. You know, we the, there we have it, everyone. Like you know, some quite quite a few quite a bit of insight actually into how you should be thinking about creating a successful startup and what secrets go into it. And it always starts from yourself, right? Not just the, the extrinsic values that sort of said starts all intrinsically, obviously. And you need to think about things, you know, in a very sort of positive way, right? And if you're looking to grow your business yourself, you know, you should really be implementing some of the key themes that we've talked about here. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to engage with Trevor's content so far, I would definitely recommend it. Um, I'll, I'll link to that all below, but you know, Trevor, this has been amazing. It's been super insightful. I feel like it, I feel like people can definitely take some actionable sort of tips away from here, from this chat that we've had and considering it's more conversational, people don't realize that it's not just, you know, there's no, in, we say, you know, we say the secrets, right? But the secrets is like you said, in the magic, which we convert f from energy from one form to another. Right. And I think that's, what's incredible. There's no actual tangible secret that tells you that, Hey, if I give you no. this, then you're definitely going to become a millionaire. No, it's, it's, it's just about how you start from within and what your, what that chip on your shoulder is. Do you have one and why, what's your ultimate goal, right? That's, that's exactly how, how it's been for me. I mean, I don't have any secrets and I certainly don't have any skills. If, if I have one skill, it's that I'm pretty good at managing a small group of people, but, but you know, they have the expertise. I'm, I'm, I, th today, being an entrepreneur is more like being a conductor of an orchestra. You don't need to be able to play every instrument brilliantly. You just need to be able to hear harmony. And, and so I, that's how I view the company structure and, and the companies. And uh, everyone should do it. Everyone should have the confidence to do it because to wake up in the morning, full of excitement for the adventure that you don't know what's going to happen Absolutely. today. It's not predictable. Mm -hmm. That's the most amazing feeling in the world. I want, this is why I do these things because I want everyone to have that feeling because I feel sometimes guilty that I have it. And I know so many people that don't. And so I think where can people follow you and reach out to you, Trevor, where do you like to be reached out to, you know, and where can they buy the book if they really want to read it? Uh, the books are available anywhere where you can buy books. Uh, the Three Simple Steps uh, is New York Times bestseller three times. It's in six languages. Uh, Secrets to a Successful Startup is only a year and a bit old, and it's a New York Times bestseller. So you can get it anywhere, but the best place to go is trevorgblake.com because my digital marketing team, I really irritate them because I give away so much stuff for free. <laughs> <laughs> they don't, and they don't like that, and they keep telling me off for it, but I still keep doing it. So, so there's, there's, there's lots of information, lots of articles, podcasts, probably 300 podcasts that I've done and, and uh, the free download, the practical magic of five hour workday. Uh, there's a seven day mentality control diet challenge that you can do. Um, so it's lots of stuff you get for free, trevorgblake.com. I might have to try some. Go down that out. rabbit hole and see where it takes you. Yeah, absolutely. I might have to try some of this stuff out myself and you don't have to worry about the content aspect. I think the fact that we're giving away is more, we're in a value centric economy, so it's totally fine. Right. Um, <laughs> but yes, everyone, like if you, if you like today's episode and you want to see more, you know, I'd appreciate it if you guys comment or, or follow, uh, depending on what medium you're actually listening to or watching this on, but otherwise, yeah, hit Trevor up and uh, hit myself up. If you have any questions, you know, drop them in the comments again. And if you want to, definitely see more content like this subscribe to the channel and do share it so we can get the message out there right so we can help others and being successful with this growth mindset thanks for everyone i will look forward to seeing you in the next episode see ya thanks neil